live. I'm reading Many Lifetimes as a collaboration between Joan Marshall Grant and her then husband, Dennis Kelsey. She passed away in 1989 and she was a seer. Uh, these chapters are uh, shared between them. So one chapter is by Joan and I just finished one uh, of hers, chapter nine. I'm now in chapter 10 and it is entitled Ray by Dennis Kelsey. We met Ray in 1959 when she was 32 and soon afterward she asked me to see if she could if she could learn to induce a state of auto-hypnosis so that she could use it to switch off discomfort during the later stage of pregnancy and pain during the birth of her third child. She proved to be an excellent subject and acquired considerable proficiency in the technique in half a dozen sessions. She was in complete sympathy with our ideas and became a close friend and staunch ally. She did not live in London and as she was fully occupied in coping extremely efficiently with three children, the chores of a household in which there was a constant stream of visitors and an antique shop, we did not see her nearly as often as we would certainly have done had we all been less busy. After we moved to Colonge in 1963, she was able to spend two short holidays with us and we met three or four times during our infrequent visits to England. We had not heard from her for six months when, on the 6th of June 1966, 6th of June 66, 1966, she telephoned us. She was in a London hospital and had just been told that a lump in her right breast had proved to be cancer and of a very malignant type and that a mastectomy, mastectomy would be useless. The specialist had said, frankly, that she had only a 50-50 chance of surviving for five years. So, if she achieved this, the likelihood of a reoccurrence would each year diminish. An indication of Ray's quality is that she spoke as though this appalling news were no more than a tiresome problem to be overcome with a minimum of trouble to anyone else. She was to have a six weeks course of deep, deep x-ray therapy, but this would give her an excuse to leave the chores to other people while she came to Colonge to convalesce. She made no secret of the fact that she had cancer, but she maintained a cheerful facade to everyone except Joan, from whom she knew it was needless to conceal her real feelings. They did not often write or telephone to each other, but Joan was often with her when they were asleep. If I had had any doubts about their ability to communicate in this way, these would have been abolished by an incident which occurred on the 8th of July. Joan woke in tears saying that Ray was feeling terribly depressed. She is revolted by a new symptom and feels that Instead of the cancer being just a lump in her breast, it is spreading all over her. And what makes it even worse is that she is so ashamed of being in despair. Although we knew that telephone conversations with Ray were limited to triviality, for she was afraid of being overheard at her end of the line and causing anxiety, Joan rang up that morning, fortunately at a moment when Ray who could speak freely because she was alone in the house. I picked up the extension, expecting to take part in the conversation, and heard Ray describing what Joan had already told me two hours earlier. The new symptom was profuse weeping from the skin burn caused by the final dose of X-ray, a factor which cannot always be avoided in a necessarily intensive course of this treatment. I heard Ray say, until the burn went so disgustingly soggy and sore, I had managed to disassociate myself from the cancer, almost as though I were one of the doctors to whom I'm only a right breast with a secondary in the armpit. Now I feel it is spreading all over me. I'm so ashamed of this panic. I know you are with me most nights, but tonight be even more than usually solid. 
and give me a brisk bounce if you think there's any danger of the stiff upper lip beginning to quiver. Ray arrived at Colons in the late evening of the 26th of July. Overjoyed to see us and not unduly exhausted, considering that she had had to leave her home three hours before taking off for Bordeaux, our nearest airport, and then had four more hours by road in ambulance. She slept well and the following morning I made a careful physical examination. The x-rays had caused discoloration of the skin on the right side of her chest, from the base of her neck to the waist. In many places this had already started to peel and several sites were weeping profusely. The practice with hypnosis which Ray had had when we first met proved useful, for I was quickly able to induce a surgical degree of anesthesia, which meant that not only were her dressings changed without discomfort, but she could immediately use her right arm freely, which she had been unable to do for several weeks. The growth was readily discernible, but there was every reason to believe that the X-rays had rendered it inactive, and I was unable to find any signs of squared. The only ominous feature, which I did not mention either to her or to Joan, was that the timbre of her voice had altered, a change undetectable when she had been speaking on the telephone, and which might be due to an enlargement of glands in her chest. She was very optimistic about her chances of making a good recovery, an optimism which was increased by the rapidity with which her skin healed and by the improvement in her sleep, appetite, energy and general well-being. But she took the realistic attitude that her cure was by no means certain and that she should use this opportunity to resolve any character traits which might cause her to precipitate herself back into incarnation, or to use her own words, whether I die next year or when I'm 90, I want to be sure I shan't promptly land myself back to ball in another pram. She asked us to help her to get rid of three facets of her personality. First, there was a compulsion to undertake a load of good work that was far larger than she could cope with. Second, she had a fear that she was a coward, which often drove her to appear excessively brave. Third, she had a fund of fury, which she could contain only by concealing even fully justified anger. I anticipated that these would all be resolved without going beyond the framework of her current life. The first indication that in this I was mistaken occurred during our second session. This began with her telling me that she had had a dream which had reminded her of the guilt and inadequacy she had felt at being unable to bring herself to chat to the other patients who were waiting for their turn in the x-ray unit. In the dream, she had seen herself surrounded by people who, quite unlike those she had seen in the hospital, were maimed and deformed. The most distressing feature of the dream had been a feeling of intense guilt that she had been unable to change the expression of mute despair in their eyes. I hypnotized her and asked, from what disease were these people suffering? The answer came immediately, leprosy. Before I could ask another question, Joan opened the door. Instead of quietly withdrawing as she would normally have done if she had inadvertently interrupted a session, she beckoned me out of the room. She told me that she had had a sudden hunch that Ray was about to tune into a life that was concerned with leprosy. I had a glimpse of it in a dream two nights ago before she arrived, but she was not really enough. Oh, before she arrived, but it was not really clear enough to tell, to tell you about it. It will be too tiring for her to relive it. So I will do, this, do it this afternoon and try to diffuse it for her. Keep her with you while I am working in case she picks up a resonance. Ray was surprised and even rather indignant when I parried her suggestion that we should have another session after lunch to explore the implications of her exclamation, leprosy. 
but I kept her attention firmly riveted in the present by playing Tom Lehrer on the record player. At about five o'clock, I saw Joan walking back to the house, looking very weary. She told me that she had managed to make a very close identification with an earlier personality of Ray, which had been involved with lepers in either the 8th or the 9th century AD. This woman, who had long flaxen hair, had committed some sin, of which the details were not entirely clear because she had accepted forgiveness for it, although only at the price of a penance. This penance had been self-inflicted and not undertaken at the command of any ecclesiastical authority. The sin was connected with the death of the woman's husband, who had been killed, probably murdered, when it was recognized that he had contracted leprosy during a long absence abroad. The region where she lived was forested with pine trees and the people had fair skins, so it may have been Sweden or one of the other Baltic countries. The woman for nine years had made herself responsible for the care of the lepers. She provided them with shelter in the wooden huts in their forest clearing. She took them food, dressed their wounds, and in her eyes, by far the most important service, brought them the bread of the Eurocrist, for they were not permitted even to approach the chapel. John recalled many terrible details about the condition of each patient, of whom there were between 55 and 60. She could not be more precise. Details. She she could not be more precise, details which I was thankful for Ray had not had to see. Then this woman herself had contracted leprosy. She knew this only when carrying a rushlight which had burned so low that it was singed in her hand. The priest, instead of giving her the bread, stared at her in horror and then fled to a door behind the altar. He must have known that total insensitivity of the fingers is one of the early signs of this disease. The woman also fled alone into the forest, there consumed with remorse at no longer having the courage to look after the people who trusted her, she died. John was not sure whether she had died from cold, it was winter, or whether she carried out her intention of hanging herself with her belt. I tailed row I told Ray only the bare outlines of the story, but it was sufficient for her to accept its validity. She said she felt as though a tremendous burden had been lifted from her shoulders, and I had never seen her so gay and carefree as she was that evening. During luncheon a few days later, when the complement of guests and children had been augmented by four others who had arrived unannounced with books for Joan to sign, I noticed that Ray was unusually silent. When people had dispersed, some to swim in the Dordogne, others to go with Joanne to see a chateau, she marched determinedly to my study. The door had hardly closed behind her when she exploded. You must find out where my rage comes from. It flares up when I least expect it. One of the droppers in, whom Joan insisted on feeding, made a fatuous remark about our lovely village. I just managed not to make a riposte, which would have sent her scuttling and shame for her silliness. But I was so choked with fury that I couldn't eat anything, and she went on placidly munching. I calmed her down and then induced hypnosis. At the count of ten I asked her what word came into her mind. The word was stone. It occurred to me that this might be leading to a scene in which she had been stoned to death and I was considering whether it would be better to break off the session until Joan had returned when Ray continued. I can see a stone wall. It is wet. I'm in a cell. The light comes through a circular opening above me. About seven feet from the ground there is an iron ring in the wall. At this point she became very distressed and asked me to bring her back to the present. But when I had done so, instead of accepting my suggestion that we should postpone any further exploration, she said, the scene is still too vivid and I know I must go through with it. 
When she had again shifted level, I asked her how she got into the cell. I'm being dragged there by an infuriated mob. I can see their feet, filthy and ragged. I'm a man. I wear a brown robe like a monk habit. How dare they do this to me? She paused and then said urgently, Count up to twenty and get me out further. I must see why they are doing this to me. I had only begun to count when she exclaimed, It is because of what I was doing with the acolytes. She sounded astonished. I only did it because I was so bored. I was bored with everyone in that horrible little community. They are poor and mean and degraded. Even the countryside is hideous, hot and dusty and barren. Not a tree in sight, only a few goats. Every day three men come into the cell and tie me by my arms to the ring in the wall. They leave me hanging there while the people look down through the hole above me and jeer. The wall is so smooth that I cannot get any purchase on it with my feet to ease the agony in my shoulders. Oh God, how I hate them. Hate them even more than they hate me. As I still thought it possible that she had been stoned to death, I asked, did the people throw anything? No, they only jeered, and at least, and at last, they no longer bothered even to torment me. No one came to my cell. I had no water and no food. Did you stay there to haunt them? I hope so. It would have served them bloody well right. This was said with such gusto that I had no doubt that she was the desire, it was the desire for revenge which had caused the fragment of that personality to become anchored in the cell. I thought we could discuss the implications of this attitude better in normal consciousness, so I brought her out of hypnosis. She recognized that she had found the reservoir of rage which had seemed about to break its barriers <clears throat> whenever she felt that she or someone of whom she was fond was being misjudged or even slighted. She recognized also that the cause of the man in the cell becoming a ghost had nothing to do with the actions which had led to his persecution, but was solely his hatred and his desire for revenge. For an hour or so I reminded her of various episodes in current life about which, in spite of several sessions directed towards trying to show her that they were irrelevant, she had continued to feel extremely resentful. Now she could see them impartially from the other person's point of view as well as from her own and make such comments as, it wasn't his fault, I was deliberately being tiresome or I drooled with sympathy because I was frightened of being cross. When what would have done far, good, far more good was a brisk bounce. Then she was silent for several minutes until she exclaimed, at last I can see how loathsome it is to bear grudges. I am free. Goodness, I feel so happy. Even when in the best of health, Ray had always suffered from insomnia and, like Joan, considered it perfectly normal to read at least one book before she even tried to sleep and during the night would probably start on another her bedroom was next to ours, and if Joan saw that her light was still on after a couple of hours, she would go in to see whether she wanted tea, soup or company, or perhaps a moonlight stroll in the garden. Ray had promised to fetch Joan if she had a twinge of pain, or even if she was lonely. So we were both worried when she admitted that for two nights running, she had lain wide awake because she was racked with sciatica. I was relieved to find that the sciatica was coming from nothing more sinister than a patch of lumbar fibrositis. Ray was convinced that its origin was psychological, but I wanted her to have several days rest because before giving her the chance of del delving into another incarnation. I tried to cure it by physical means and with straight hypnotic suggestion. I persisted with this policy for two days, but as it proved entirely ineffective, I hypnotized her and asked her for a clue which might lead us to its real source. So I finish this here and continue this chapter 10 uh, another time.